Hi, I'm Karis Cotter, and today I'm going to read you my book, The Fairyland Visitor, A Mysterious Tale, with artwork by Gerald L. Squires. Now, this is a true ghost story that was told to me by two of the people that, hap that it happened to, Jerry Squires, the artist, and his daughter, Esther. They both told me what they remembered about this ghost, and I wrote it out in my own words, and then Jerry gave us a lot of his paintings that he'd done of Fairyland to use in the book. So he also did some original line drawings and gave us some family photos. So it's a family memoir as well as a ghost story. So I'm going to take you through the book so you can see what, it, what the book looks like as I tell you the story. The first picture is of the Fairyland Lighthouse back in the day, in the 1970s. You can see they're fixing it up because it was in pretty bad shape when they moved in. And this is a little sketch Jerry did. They moved into the lighthouse in October. The spooky month, said Esther. The stormy month, said her father, looking out past the lighthouse to the wild blue Atlantic Sea. The lonely month, said her sister Miranda. The cold month, said her mother, looking at the torn wallpaper flapping in the draft from the broken window. No one had lived in the lighthouse keeper's house for seven years. The keepers and their families moved away when the lighthouse was automated. Now a man came out to check on it every few weeks. But gone were the days when the light had to be tended every day to make sure it would, never went out. And there's a picture of Esther and Miranda. For seven years, the house stood empty at the end of the narrow strip of land, beaten and battered by the wind and the sea. The windows were broken, the roof leaked, the house smelled of damp. No one had laughed or cried or shouted or slept in it for a long, long time. Then Esther and her family moved in. It seemed the ideal place for her father to paint and her mother to make pots with the wild, rocky Atlantic shoreline for inspiration. Esther, who was six, and Miranda, who was seven, went to the local school in Fairyland, a two-mile walk along the road that wound from the lighthouse to the shore. They always knew when somebody was coming to visit because they could see most of the road from the kitchen window, curving through the downs, inching along the narrows, twisting up the hill, and disappearing around the corner. Nobody came those first couple of weeks. Esther's parents were busy hammering up loose clapboard and replacing windows. Every day after school, Esther and Miranda explored the house and the rocks and the paths along the downs. The fall weather seemed to change every few minutes from bright, clear, blue, from bright blue clear skies to cloudy gray ones. Fog and rain blew in from the ocean and then blew out again. The last week of October, just before Halloween, Esther was running along the path past the lighthouse, the sun on her face. The ocean was a deep cobalt blue, stretching out on three sides of the point, stretching out forever. She stopped, lifted her arms, and spun in a slow circle, taking in the ocean, the lighthouse, the headlands, the road to the shore. Then she dropped her arms and peered into the distance. Something was moving along the road, heading towards the lighthouse. string of animals? Esther put up her hand to shade her eyes. Sheep? No, too big. Cows? She couldn't tell. She jumped over a rock, ran down the hill, and set off along the road to meet them. As they got closer, she could see they weren't cows at all, but horses. At least a dozen brown and black horses. What are you looking at, Esther? called her father. He was down at the well, filling up the water buckets. There was no running water in the lighthouse, so they had to fetch all of their water from the well. Horses, said Esther, coming down the road. He looked up. The horses were crossing the narrows now in single file. 
Behind them, a cloud of fog drifted down from the hill. Esther's dad laid a carrying hoop across the buckets and stepping inside it, picked them up by the handles. The hoop kept the buckets balanced and cut down on the water, sloshing over the edge as he walked. He headed back towards the lighthouse, Esther skipping along beside him. Where do the horses come from? She asked. Fairyland. When the weather's good, their owners let them roam wherever they want to. That's what I'd like best if I was a horse, said Esther, balancing on a small rock for a few seconds and then jumping off. Running free wherever I want to go. Her father smiled. Wait till next summer. When school's over, you can run around free like a Newfoundland pony all summer. The horses caught up with them and slowly passed, tails flicking. For a few minutes, Esther and her father were in the middle of the herd. Then the horses moved on ahead. The fog came right along behind them, swirling around their feet and creeping up over the bushes at the side of the road. Esther looked back. She couldn't see the far side of the narrows anymore. You know why they come, said her father, picking his way carefully on the rocky road. Arch told me the horses always come out to the lighthouse when there's fog rolling in. The fog makes the grass taste sweeter. So if you see horses coming along the road, you know we're in for some weather. Esther plucked a long piece of grass from the side of the road and nibbled on the root end. Yes, she said, I think they're right. Very sweet. Her father laughed and they went off the hill to the lighthouse. Esther went into the kitchen where her mother, Miranda, and Houndy, their dog, were building a wooden bench. Miranda was handing her nails to her mother, who was hammering away. Houndy watched her, her head on her paws. Where have you been, said her mother. The fog's rolling in. Esther looked out the window. A grayish white cloud was drifting up from the south, obscuring parts of the shore and the road. To the north, she could see the dim shapes of the horses grazing on the downs. She sat down by the window and watched clumps of grass and rocks disappear and then appear again as the fog crept along the headland. Behind her, she could hear her mother and sister hammering and talking. Then her father came in. Their voices faded away and she got that strange, fainty feeling she'd been having a lot lately. She leaned her head on the cold new glass of the window. The fog had lifted a bit now, and she could see the road all the way to the Narrows. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Esther jumped. Who on earth? said her mother. Esther followed her father into the hallway. A tall man was standing just inside the front door. Houndy sat at his feet, thumping her tail and looking up at the visitor with a big doggy smile on her face. That was strange. Houndy took her role as a watchdog very seriously and always barked her head off any time anyone came near their old house. But this time she hadn't made a peep. Good day, sir. The stranger had a creaky voice. Your dog asked me to come in. From what Esker could see of the dark hallway, in the dark hallway, the man was wearing a long black coat that brushed the top of his big boots. Around his neck was a white collar. Esther had seen those white collars before. This must be the local priest, she thought. Come to welcome us to Fairyland. She took a step closer. Esther's father laughed. Well then, you'd better come in, he said. Houndy is a very serious dog. It's best to do what she says. The big man came forward, handing his coat to Esther's father. Then she saw he wasn't a priest at all, but just a man wearing a white turtleneck sweater. He lumbered into the kitchen, greeted the others, and sat down in the chair closest to the glowing wood stove. The few strands of hair left on his mostly bald head were white and his face grisly with wrinkles. He seemed a bit stiff, from the cold, perhaps. Esther's mother offered him a cup of tea, and soon they were all sitting around the kitchen table having a chat. The man told them 
come by to see what the new people in the lighthouse were like. I've been coming out to this lighthouse for a long time, he said, smiling at Esther. I was good friends with the last keeper, and I've spent many a night out here with him watching the TV. He had it before anyone else along here, because he had the electricity, and we didn't. The man went on to tell them he used to be Fairyland's policeman. Esther's mother and father asked him questions about the old days, and the man spun a tale or two. He told them about a boy who had caught pneumonia and died in the lighthouse, and showed them where the body was laid out for the wake. After a few more cups of tea and a drink of whiskey, he told them about the many other wakes he'd attended at the lighthouse, the storms he'd seen, the people who had come and gone. He twinkled his eyes at Esther, and after a while she went and sat on his lap to listen to his stories. He smelled like tobacco. At one point he fished in his jacket pocket and came up with a quarter to give her. Esther held it tightly. That was a lot of money. She could buy two chocolate bars and some bubble gum with it next time they went to the store. After his second glass of whiskey, he started telling Bible stories, but they seemed a bit mixed up. He had He'd had Jacob swallowed by a whale instead of Jonah, and Abraham parting the Red Sea instead of Moses. Esther knew better than that, but everyone was having fun and no one could corrected him. Finally, he stood up to go. Thank you for your hospitality. I'm happy to meet you all, and now I know you'll be good for this lighthouse. It's still the friendly spot it always was. He leaned over and patted Houndy on the head. Goodbye, old fella. Esther's dad walked him out. After the door closed behind him, Esther's mom stood up and began to clear the table. Esther drifted over to her spot by the window and examined her quarter in the light. It was a bit grimy, but so she gave it a rub with the end of her t-shirt. She could just make out the date, 1950. She looked up and along the road. Streamers of fog still hung along the shore, but she could see way past the narrows. The road was empty. Her mother came up behind her and put her hands on Esther's shoulders, peering out. Where's he got to, she asked. Did he just fly away? Maybe he's taking a look around, said Esther's dad, loading some logs into the wood stove. I didn't see him arrive either, said her mother. Then she turned back into the kitchen to clear the cups and saucers off the table. Esther sat down in the chair by the window. Neither did I, she whispered. She had that fainty feeling again and took some deep breaths. Behind her, the family was busy with this and that. But Esther didn't move. She could see the horses still up on the downs. The fog was nearly gone now, and the road was clear as far as the turn on the hill. A long time later, her mother came up behind her again. Any sign of our visitor, Esther? Nope. That's strange, said her mother. The next day, Esther drove with her father to visit Arch, a friend who lived on the other side of the hill. Her dad and Arch talked about how they were settling in, what repairs they were doing to the lighthouse. Oh, and we had our first visitor yesterday, said Esther's dad, a very friendly guy, an old timer. Who was that? asked Arch. I didn't see anyone go past. Well, we never did get his name, did we, Esther? She shook her head. But he said he used to be a policeman in Fairyland and he was good friends with the lighthouse keeper in the old days. He told us lots of stories about the lighthouse. What about a little boy who died of pneumonia out there after falling into the water in cold weather? Hmm, said Arch. A policeman, you say? Yes, a constable. What did he look like, said Arch. Tall, nearly bald, long black coat, big mouth, blue eyes, long nose, sticky out ears, added Esther, and he gave me a quarter. Lucky you, said Arch. Look, Jerry, I don't want to alarm you, but the man you describe and that story about the little boy, well, it sounds like Dick Coslow. I don't know who else it could be. He was the constable around here for many years, and that 
boy dying, that happened in his time. Annie was good friends with the keeper, out there a few nights every week just for the company. Yes, that's what he said. He said he, said he used to watch TV there before anyone else had it. Arch nodded his head. That's true, but here's the odd thing. He paused and gave Esther's dad a strange look. Yes, what's the odd thing? Arch glanced at Esther and then back to her dad. Well, it couldn't have been Dick Coslow. He died 20 years ago. Esther felt the fainty feeling stronger than ever and clutched at her father's arm. What? said her father, starting to laugh. You're kidding me, right, Arch? Arch shook his head. Nope. He's dead, all right. And yet the man you described is the spitting image of him. As the cold winter wore on, Esther and her family slowly adapted to life in the lighthouse. They ate, slept, and worked in the kitchen because the rest of the house was just too cold. The lighthouse girls, as they were called by the kids in school, had to walk with their dad all the way to school on the days when the ice made it impossible to drive the, wind, the windy road along the narrows and over the hill. The winter seemed very long. Spring came finally, and that summer, Esther ran free like a Newfoundland pony, just as her father had said she would. She went out in the morning and wasn't seen again until lunch, playing on the rocks and exploring the downs. And every time she saw a string of horses making their way across the narrows, she looked up to see if the fog was rolling in. It always was. Her mother opened a pottery shop at the lighthouse, and sunny days brought lots of visitors. One day, Esther was wrapping a piece of pottery for a customer while her father counted out her change. Esther noticed that he kept giving the woman funny looks, as if he wanted to ask her something. She was a tall woman with a square face, and something about her was familiar. You sound like you're from the States, said Esther's dad. Yes, said the woman. You wouldn't know I was born right around here from the way I talk now, would you? She told them she'd grown up near Fairyland, but had married an American and moved away years before. I guess I lost my Newfoundland accent after all those years away. I have family here and I finally came back for a visit, she said. I'm going to make a guess, said Esther's dad. You're Dick Coslow's daughter. Esther edged over to her dad and took a hold of his sleeve tight. Now it was the woman's turn to stare. How did you know that, she said. You look just like him, said Esther's dad. I knew there was something familiar about you the minute you walked in the shop. I couldn't place it till now. When did you meet my dad, asked the woman. You're not from here. Well, said Esther's father slowly, I think we had a visit from him last fall. He took the astonished woman by the arm and led her outside to sit on a bench in the sun, Esther trailing along behind. Then he told her the whole story, from the knock at the door until the time the man walked out the door, never to be seen again. As she listened, the look of wonder on her face grew. She kept shaking her head and making startled little noises. I've never heard anything like this, she said when the story was over. It certainly sounds like my dad. He told me many of those same stories when I was growing up. He loved this lighthouse. It was his second home. Her eyes glistened with tears. The most amazing thing is what he said when you first saw him. That's what convinces me it really was my dad. What was that, said Esther's dad. Well, dad was known around here to always say the same thing when he walked into someone's house. He visited a lot of people. That was part of his job. He'd knock at the door and then walk right in and say exactly the same thing every time. The woman started to laugh, tears still trickling down her face. What did he say? asked Esther. The woman looked down at her. He'd say, 
your dog asked me to come in. And that's the end of the story. And there's a little snap of Houndy getting the last word. Another sketch Jerry did. And here at the very back, there's a few more family photos of their life at the lighthouse, the Squires family in the 1970s. There's Gail and Jerry and some horses, and Esther with some kind of animal, a dog or a cat, kitten, and kitten, I think. And then there's another scene. And right at the very end, there's a picture of Dick Costlow when he was a constable. So there's a picture of the ghost when he was alive. And there's one more picture at the very end of a woman carrying a hoop with uh, around her two buckets. Then that's just like Jerry had to help her carry the buckets so the water wouldn't slosh out. And that's the end of the story of the Fairyland Visitor. This was a book was a lot of fun to work on. Fairyland's a beautiful spot. And Jerry's paintings make it all just come to life. And of course, Esther was a wonderful storyteller and she was all grown up when I met her, but she remembered very well her days at the lighthouse. So I hope you've enjoyed this book and I hope it's given you something to think about, about maybe something new to think about, about what happens to people after death and whether people can come back the way the Fairyland Visitor did in this story. I'm Karis Cotter, and that's all for now. Bye.